All right, everybody, we're going to get started. Thank you all for coming. My name is Brandi Guthrie. I'm your 2017 president for the Austin Board of Realtors and really appreciate all of you joining us today for our NAR forum with NAR president-elect Elizabeth Mendenhall. And of course, this would not be possible without the help of our sponsors, who we really appreciate. And today we would like to thank Austin Title for sponsoring this event. And if Roxanne Ford is available, will you please come up? Good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Nice to see you all this morning. Um, I'm always very proud to be a part of um, sponsoring the forums, being a part of the industry, and being a part of a conversation like what is the future of NAR, what is the future for all of us. We're at very interesting times with the rewrite of our land code, with what is going on with, um, with just our neighborhoods in our city, and it's very exciting. I've lived here 25 years, and I feel like, and maybe it's because I'm older now, <laughs> that I get more involved, but I do feel like it's at such a crucial time to make decisions today and how that's going to look down the road for my little one that's growing up now and, and what that means for all of us and for our future in the industry. At Austin Title, we've been in this market. We opened up in 1953, and so we've seen a lot of change, and it's been exciting. And for future, I feel like we'll be here for a very, very long time, owned by the largest title insurer in the world, Fidelity. And it's put us, given us a global perspective these last 10 years of being owned by them and being able to insure title everywhere. And I always tell people the most important thing that someone walks away from closing is not really the keys, but it is your title and that it's clear and that it's insured and that that is their future and their security. Um, we did pass out some hot topical things right now with our schools. Texas Education Agency just uh, sent out the ratings a week ago. And for many of you that know our graphic designer, Jamie Yacobachi, who works very hard at these things, she wanted to make sure that y'all had those in your hands this morning. It's the most requested item that we give out all year, um, our school piece and our economic indicator piece, and also, of course, our closers and um, all of our locations. So once again, we appreciate the business we do with all of y'all, and I'm glad we're all here in this conversation and engaging um, here at, at the Austin Board of Realtors today. Thank you so much. We have a $50 gift card to Jack Allen. So sorry. Yay, sorry, you're Brandy. Good. Our icon, Becky Hopkins, is holding the box. And let's see. It's a Realty Austin card. Michelle Allen, who I haven't seen in a while. Hi. Yeah. Congratulations. Before we begin, I'd like to recognize your Austin Board of Realtors directors that are in attendance today. Would you please stand and be recognized? I'd also like to recognize our NAR directors, if you would please stand and be recognized. We do have other guests with us that I'd like to recognize. Lori Levy, TAR General Counsel and Vice President of Legal Affairs. And those serving as ABOR's TAR directors and regional vice presidents and TREPAC trustees, please stand. Now I'd like to get the program going by introducing our very special guest, Elizabeth Mendenhall. She is a realtor from Columbia, Missouri, is the 2017 president-elect of the National Association of Realtors. NER, the voice of real estate, is America's largest trade association representing 1.3 million realtors involved in all aspects of real estate from commercial to residential. She is the CEO for Remax Boone Realty in Columbia and has been a realtor for 20 years. Remax named her the Mid-States Missouri Broker Owner of the Year in 2009 and the International Broker Manager of the Year in 2006. She's a sixth-generation realtor. 
She has received several de designations, such as Accredited Buyer Representative, Accredited Buyer Representative Manager, Certified International Property Specialist, Council of Real Estate Brokerage Managers, Performance Management Network, ePro Specialist, Learning Certified Instructor, and is a graduate of the Realtor Institute. She is also a member of Women's Council and also the Real Estate Buyers Agent Council. On the national level, Elizabeth currently serves as NAR's Executive Committee, Board of Directors, and on their leadership team. She chaired strategic planning in 2012 and served as Vice President of Committees in 2011. She was the NAR liaison to association leadership in 2008. The list continues to go on and on. This woman is very, off. very <laughs> impressive, um, all the way from being locally involved um, through the state and then also, of course, now on the national level. Um, but I would like to share with you, uh, with all of you in attendance today, what an honor this really is to have and likely the first time for our association to be able to bring NAR leadership here to come speak with you today. I've had the pleasure and opportunity to meet Elizabeth, and I know under her leadership, at the national level, great accomplishments will be achieved. She has personally inspired me, being our youngest female president at the local level, and she's another young female leaving her mark on our industry. She's driven by her passion, vision, and service to members, and her theme this year is Own It, something we must all practice in our day-to-day -day lives and in the decisions that we make. She is dedicated to hearing from members, and I know she's very excited about leading the largest trade association. Let's welcome Elizabeth Mendenhall. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. So why is everybody so pissed off at NAR? <laughs> it's real though, right? Right? Yeah. yeah. It's very real. It may not, you know, and I think in just right now in general in this country, people are pissed off. Whether you're on one side or another, you're kind of pissed off. And Steve's like, are you really going to say that? I'm like, yeah, I'm going to say it. But here's, here's kind of my story. Um, last January, so it's about a year and a half ago now, I was at Inman. So how many of you read Inman and get to Inman Conference? And you know Brad, he likes to be very provocative, likes to be very controversial. And so I'm getting ready to go on stage with my dad. My dad was president of, this, of NAR in 2001. And he's like, I want you to get up there. And when you get on the stage, he goes, I don't want you talking about NAR. Don't talk about NAR. Don't talk about any of that NAR stuff, that association stuff. He's like, do you get it? And I'm like, yeah, actually, I do get it. Our members want to know if we actually practice real estate and sell real estate and know what's happening in an escrow transaction and, you know, not what's happening on the professional standards committee, what's happening back in the business. He's like, so don't talk about any of that NAR stuff. I want you guys to talk about your business and how you've succeeded as a company and how you've grown your business. I'm like, okay. So we have the pre-conference call. Same thing. He's like, we're not going to talk about any of this association stuff. He used a harsher word said, okay, got it. So you all may know from Texas, you may know Katie Maxwell. Katie's from Houston. She has been at the MN conference several times. Katie is smart. She's intelligent. She's bright. She's real bubbly. And she's like, yeah, great. I get to be your moderator. This is so exciting. And this is so great. And, you know, and so we do our pre-con call with her and everything. And so now we're backstage at Inman and we're in our green room and Katie's back there with us. And I want you to try to maybe envision the Olympics now. Go to the track and field where they, you know, expertly pass the baton at, you know, however fast they're running, but they always do it well. So we're walking on stage and Brad literally like grabs Katie's hand and he pulls her in and she whispers in her, her ear and he just keeps walking. Like thinking, okay. So we get up on stage, and I think the first question was going to be, you know, what do you think the challenges are in the real estate industry right now? And we get up on stage, and here we are up on stage with Katie, and Katie goes, so, why is everybody so pissed off at NAR? <laughs> and, <laughs> and I think if you go back and you look at the tape, I mean, I probably was like, <laughs> thought we weren't going to talk about any of that NAR stuff, right? <laughs> and it was that moment of what happened. And, but it's a real question. And what had happened was just before us on the panel was Dave Leniger, who's CEO of Chairman of Remax, was Sherry Christ of Better Homes and Gardens, and they had another person from Realogy there. And during the course of that conversation, 
there was some angst about NAR. And what's NAR doing and what's happening? And, you know, in this world of disruption and, you know, there we go again with that word disruption. We keep talking about the word disruption and people say we need to stop talking about disruption. And somebody goes, well, that's kind of like just ignoring what's actually happening. But in this world, they're saying, you know, what is NAR doing about all of these things? And what is happening? And who is doing something? And that question then comes down to Texas Association of Realtors. And what is Texas Association of Realtors doing? And the reality is, if you do nothing, you get criticized. If you do something, you're gonna get criticized. And this is, I love this quote, and it says, criticism is something we can easily avoid by saying nothing, doing nothing, and being nothing. And somewhere in this environment, as an association, we've gotta decide, are we gonna do something which is gonna piss some people off? Are we gonna do nothing which is gonna piss some people off? Or where do we fit because things are changing? And we know that, we feel that. We feel that every single day when we walk out the door and we meet with a client who says to us, and, and you know, and it's something little, and you guys know it's something little, and it's just, it, it's like, well, I saw this on Home Light, and you're going, oh, what's Home Light? I don't know that website, you know, and you're just like, Ugh. or they give you a statistic about something in a neighborhood and they say, oh, I got that from the title company. And you're like, oh, I'm supposed to give them that. And you just feel it, you know, because you know things are changing and you're like trying to keep up and who's supposed to give it to me and where are you supposed to get it? And I'm going to tell you, that's part of why we got to own it. The only people who are going to make us better is ourselves. And it can't, we can't continue to keep looking to these other sources to say they're gonna make us better. They should have got us more information. We should have had more classes. We should have had you know, an, another form or something like that. We've gotta look inside ourselves and say, what are we doing, each one of us, to kind of get better? And I think as NAR, NAR either gets to be the disruptor, which is really gonna piss some people off, or we sit back and we kind of say, okay, We'll, you know, we'll just moderate the environment around us. A couple of years ago, um, we did a danger report. And so many of you have maybe read the danger report. It was a report on strategic planning and a report on different issues. And people got pissed off. They were pissed off. Why are you calling it danger? Why are you calling it danger? That sounds like bad things are happening in our industry. That's not right. That doesn't feel good. Some of you are laughing because you know it was true. And I told somebody, I said, you know when you're driving down the highway, you don't usually see a sign that says sunny and straight road ahead. <laughs> you see a sign that says, hey, here are some things that maybe you need to look out for, and I'm going to talk to you about them and so look out for them so that you don't end up in danger. And so there came up with 50 different kind of top items. A lot of people were surveyed. You can see over 5,000 minutes of face-to-face -face time, 74 CEOs interviewed, 7,800, almost 7,900 realtors were surveyed. And, and it, it started to break down th some of the threats and analysis. And I have now gone around the different con the country and I have surveyed s uh, local associations and state associations and said, okay, what do you think the top dangers are? And strategic planning then took and said, what do you think this top dangers are? And inevitably, we're all thinking the same thing, which is good, but it also, you know, it's what we're all trying to solve for. And someone goes, I don't, he goes, I, you got the danger report. He goes, but what are you gonna do about it? And one guy raised his hand and he goes, if we knew what we were gonna do about it, we wouldn't need the report. <laughs> I thought, there we go, right? It's hard. It's hard questions. They're hard answers. It's not easy to solve these things just overnight. And it becomes overwhelming. And I know it becomes overwhelming for volunteers because this is, as I said, this is my night job. I have a day job. I've got a brokerage to run back home. You know, you've got to, you're going to leave here, you're going to go to home inspections, you're going to go to final walkthroughs, you're going to go try to negotiate, pick up escrow checks, which why are we still picking up checks, you know, in some of these environments, you know, in days and kind of doing things like that. And, and so then to try to solve the overall economy of what's happening in real estate and solve professionalism for 1.2 million people, it's overwhelming. And you say, is that really, do I have the time to volunteer to do that? Do I have the energy to volunteer to do that? Do I want to sit on the board and try to solve those questions that I don't have? Who else is going to do it if we don't? 
you know, and I know sitting here, if you've made it here to this room, you care. You absolutely care. So the top dangers that were surveyed and continue to kind of be some of the top issues in the association, one is the masses of marginal agents that destroy our reputation. And it's the fact that the numbers just keep climbing and they keep climbing and we're seeing people get in this business and what they look like then gets, makes all of us look that way. The decline in the relevancy of agents. How are we needed in the transaction? How, what's our value of the transaction? The regulatory tsunami. You know, all of the different regulations which are happening or they're not happening in the industry or the deregulation that's happening, that's part of it. Outposition is the industry spokesperson. Are we still the voice for real estate? Does that make sense anymore? What does that even mean? Who are we talking to? Are we talking to our members? Are we talking to Congress? I and mean, what does that even mean today? And who's listening to who? And then the other thing that came up was untrained leaders. You know, and it was the conversation, and, it, and that's an inward look at us of saying, you know, are we prepared to tackle some of the changes that in this industry, and do we have the knowledge? Is the same person who knows the legislative issues the same person who should be making the decisions on the IDX and RETS feeds? Two totally different skill sets, and that's what we're questioning amongst ourselves. So we start to look at the mass of marginal agents really destroying the reputation. It comes back somewhat to that professional conversation. Now I'm going to look at you guys straight up, and I, I, and I do. You guys have the highest education of any state to get into this business. But here's what you don't have you don't have the statistic that proves that it matters. For whatever reason, there's no statistic coming out of Texas that says more education means you're more professional, means there's less complaints. So if you had that, I'd take that back to Missouri and say, yes, we can increase our license law, we can increase our continuing education, we can increase this, because I know that in Texas that matters. You don't have it. So no one, so when we look at the different studies and we're trying to do the studies around the country, we can't prove to any state government that it matters, which is really ass backwards. There we go, right? I mean, it just kind of, you're like, God, you know, it feels like that should matter to us. We know instinctively, we think that more education and we've seen that, but somehow we're not correlating it. If there's anything I would say to you guys today, do anything that you can to try to find that variable that proves that. Because if you can prove that, you can help us all across the country try to prove this. In Utah, right now, the state governor, you know, get this, so the state governor is a past state realtor president. The head of both chambers are realtors. 25% of their um, state government, the state senators and state reps are realtors. And the head of the Real Estate Commission is a past national president. I said, let's go give them like a million dollars, figure out this utopian system of what we think license law should look like, go have them pass it, see what it looks like, and two and three years from now, see if we can make any difference. I mean, that'd be really cool. That'd be kind of a cool way to try to see if we could really kind of get in, you know, to that groove to figure that out. Because... You know, we hear a lot of conversation about more hours, more hours, more hours. But then we've got the challenge of the professionalism and the attitude. It's not a time commitment. And you know what I mean when I say that. I mean, we've got agents, and I've got them in my office, who have a lot of education. But they're just not always well-liked, you know. And then I've got the agents who don't have as much of the education, who are some of the most, would be considered, some of the most professional, thoughtful, caring agents you've ever seen. So there's some other measure there that has to kind of do with, again, us owning it and our relationship with our fellow peers, which kind of determines that professionalism piece. Because the professionalism conversation isn't from the consumer. It's from us talking to each other and that we're not satisfied with the other realtor. So then the next part of this conversation goes into the cost conversation. Let's up the fees. Let's make it, you know, let's just send them sky high. I'm in Columbia, Missouri. 650 people are in my board. If you're going to join the Board of Realtors tomorrow, it costs you $1,800.
one of the highest joining fees out there. No statistics that prove less people are joining. No statistics that prove less people are renewing. Wisconsin has the highest state fees. In fact, they're $200 more than most state association fees. They are right on par with everyone else in the country as far as how many realtors go. So then you think about, okay, you know, if you did, you know, if 800 is, a, or if 1800 is $1,000 more than most boards, and then you add another $200, you know, dollars to that. So now, it, w how many boards could and have the guts to pass a $1,000 increase in their fees, but there's no statistics to prove that's gonna change it. So, you know, again, where does that fall into how we navigate this environment? So then we talk about the decline of relevancy of agents. And this really has to do with the fact that if you consider and you look at our profession for so long, we've got paid for doing all certain steps along the way. And again, we kind of know there's other players now who have gotten into the field who are trying to redefine our role and really what it means in this digital ecosystem to be a realtor. And they're entering you know, some different components of that. So one of the things that the National Consumer Campaign was geared to do, if, if maybe some of you know this, maybe some of you don't, for 17 years we had the same consumer campaign company who managed our advertising, same company. That was probably not a good idea. <laughs> so we rebid the ad campaign and three companies came in and they all showed us a similar chart like this. And it's a little high bear, but maybe you can kind of see. So up here the search starts and down here is the anxious level. When the search starts, people are excited. Like, hey, I get to go buy a home and let's go start looking for homes. And they get excited and they see these beautiful kitchens and they see, you know, oh my gosh, that could be my yard. That could be my backyard. And they're super excited about the process. And as they move down to what they would like to have versus what they actually can have versus now what their budget looks like, they, yeah, <laughs> they drop, right? But look right here. This is the point where they decide to select a realtor. They are at the same level of anxiousness when they decide to pick their realtor that they are during the negotiations and inspections. And we know how crazy they get during that point. That's where their mind is when they're thinking about picking a realtor. <coughs> so the lovey-dovey ads that you see from the portals that are the welcome home and they're, you know, and they're so touching and they make us cry. <clears throat> That's up here during the search. So the advertising campaign was switched down here to kind of say, we gotta, when they are nervous, when they are scared, they've gotta get a realtor. They've gotta remember that at this point in the transaction, they've got to grab a realtor, which is a completely different point to where they've been. Excuse me, just a minute. <clears throat> But it's kind of a fascinating slide here to see how they move all up and down the line. And so when you saw the fill ads, and again, some people liked them, some people hated them, some people were pissed off at NAR because they weren't lovey-dovey. They didn't feel good, they didn't feel the same. It was a whole different attempt to try to tackle that consumer in a whole different mindset, in a different mindset that we had in the past. And this piece of it, it reflected <coughs> really, really well with millennials, like really well with millennials. Um, now the good and bad news is, is that some millennials were ready to buy, some millennials weren't ready to buy. So you'll see the next kind of wave of the ad campaign coming out with a little bit different twist on it, but still there's that little bit of edge there to try to grab the consumer of where they're kind of moving to. Because one of the things that's happening is in the FinTech area. So FinTech stands for financial tech, the whole purpose of this industry is to disrupt the financial services. So that's the whole purpose of disrupting incumbent financial systems and corporations that rely left on software, less on software. What is the number one financial transaction someone does? It's their home. So this whole entire industry now is trying to disrupt this process. 
So if you think about it, we have seen billions of dollars that were invested to the search process since we really started search back in 1997 when we went online and we went on realtor.com and we started that search online. Now we're seeing billions of dollars being invested into this service process. The next piece of it, of what does it look like contract to close? And these are just some actual numbers. In 2013, it was 4 billion. 2014, it was 12. <coughs> 2015, it was 40 billion. It was estimated about 120 billion in 16. Who knows what it's going to be in 17? You're seeing Bitcoin, you're seeing PayPal, you're seeing all the players get into this area of how this money transfers. So that's, this is, a, this is big money now being spent in our space of how we manage that transaction. And then all that, of course, leads to the regulation that goes around it. And where do we fit in there and the different regulations that were kind of flowing? Um, one of the studies that the CFPB do, and they'll still refer to this, I was with them this summer at a digital closings seminar, and we brought in all the players, mortgage companies, we brought in um, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, we brought in the, some of the title companies, all to try to get really this true electronic closing from start to close, where we were accomplishing all the things along the way. And the CFPB will still refer to this study that they published in August of 2015, where the consumer feels more empowered, they feel more educated when it closes electronically. And this past um, summer, they just did a study in North Carolina where they worked with different vendors along the way to go from the close. And same thing, the consumers are rating that as a better experience. So you're seeing that kind of move. The biggest holdup is our lenders. They've got proprietary systems. They don't have the research and development to change their software, to change their platforms on how they're managing their forms, how they're storing their forms. But what's happening then is now, other entrants are coming into that space and saying, okay, maybe that's the way you lend money, but now I'm going to show you a new way to lend money and a new way to fund a transaction. <coughs> that's where you guys have got to be critical. I mean, you, you're absolutely critical, and you, and you play that part. I mean, in the state of Texas, you guys passed and you became proactive on legislation with your transfer taxes. That, you guys, give yourselves a huge hand for that. I mean, it's huge. And we can sit back on these regulation pieces or we can be proactive and we can be the ones creating the regulation around it and being at the table and kind of having that conversation and saying, no, here's why I know it's better that you send the closing documents to me and that it's okay that I see them, right? <laughs> We've had those arguments. And so that's part of the realtor party is really again going in and not just being reactive, but being proactive in these regular and legislative changes because somebody's got to be talking about it. So we go to our next point of out positioned as the industry spokesperson. And this is the comment because we see Zillow at the White House and we get pissed. You want to be pissed at NAR? You get pissed, right? And say, why were they at the table? Why weren't we at the table? How do we figure out, you know, who's really talking? But this is the clutter that you got to sort through. I mean, you got to sort through the fact that our members honestly will read an article about whether or not whoever Kardashian this is changed her hair versus an article that's talking about something that happened with the treasury that might affect our interest rates, right? I mean, it's, it's very true and it's a very hard place to float. And then, so then you gotta just get loud and you gotta get mean and you gotta get mad and you got, but, but you gotta cut through. And Inman does a good job of cutting through because he puts these sensational headlines out there. You know, and we look at it, it's sensational. And you, you grab that email before you grab the email from an air. I do. You know, the, you know what the number one email was last year that was opened up by our members? Haunted house horrors. <laughs> it was. You know, and so then what happened? So then our members say, well, we don't get anything. We don't get the information from NAR. We don't see it from NAR. We, it's there, but do we see it? Do we hear it? Do we track it? Do we get it? You know, it's there. And so that becomes a very, very big challenge. And I know this association and every association struggles with that of trying, and we struggle with our own clients of that, of trying to break through. Did they hear from us? Did they see us? You know, was it customized to them? You know, and how of that fits in. And then when we hear from this guy, we really get mad. We really get mad because all of a sudden we start to relate 
the conversation to a person because we follow people. We don't necessarily follow companies and we don't necessarily follow corporations. We hired a new CEO this year. Many of you have, have seen the notices. We hired a gentleman by the name of Bob Goldberg who was with the association for 22 years. And one of the things when we hired him and that is now in the new CEO's job description is to be a voice for this association, to be socially active and to engage in our members. Because before it was the National Association of Realtors liked Joe's page. Well, great, who's that? That's, that, that's, that's the building in the sky somewhere in Chicago. But now it's Bob Goldberg who goes in and likes Joe's page because it's a different environment. You've got to connect with this association differently. You've got to connect with the officers differently, even though we change from year to year. And one of the biggest problems is because the officers change from year to year, we don't build any consistency. The only way to do that is to build it with our CEO. So we've challenged him with that task of now really becoming, you know, the face for the association because he is the consistency. And some of our members go, well, that's not right. It's a members association. The president should be the spokesperson. But how do you do that year to year to year when my voice is different than Bill Brown's voice, who's the current president, it's a little different than John Smaby's voice, who's next year's president, you know, and, and have something that our members can relate to. And so we're all trying to figure this out, you know, trying to figure this out in this new environment together. And so then our members see things like this. Zillow reaches a $130 million settlement with MOVE. We understand who MOVE is and the dispute over trade secrets. And they go, great, NAR just got $130 million. Well, MOVE did. MOVE's the operator of Realtor.com. We did get $8 million of that lawsuit, which is what we contributed to some of our legal costs. But you see these numbers? You have to realize most of our members will never touch, never see, Never, I, I wish I would have had $130 million. I'm, I've never seen and played, you know, with that type of money. And they just go, this is my dues. This is my money. What's happening over there at NAR, you know? I'll, I want to tell you the story about this because it's, it's just fascinating when you think of how you manage an association and things that are happening today. So we're in the middle of this lawsuit, and if you, if you don't, I'll give you a little background information on it. We had two employees who worked for Realtor.com. Those two employees then moved to Zillow. And in the course of it, we um, moved, sued them for sharing trade secrets along the way. And it never ended up going to trial. The day that we were supposed to go to trial, I was actually um, in a plane headed out to Seattle where the trial was gonna be held, we settled. So, 430 million. <laughs> so that morning, it's now 12 o'clock, and it is 12 o'clock central time. And we get the phone call from our attorney that says, the lawsuit has now been settled. <coughs> okay, great. They said, it's still confidential. We're trying to work out the details of it, how it's gonna be announced, but nobody, nothing is gonna be announced until 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, because they're in Seattle, and so the attorneys are gonna continue to kind of work it out and figure that out, it'll be at the end of the day. Okay, great. So as a leadership team, we're sitting there going, all right, what are our members gonna think when they see this? they're gonna think that NAR got $130 million. And how are we gonna address that? And how are we gonna tackle that? And how are we gonna say, no, we didn't get 130 million, but we got eight. And then our members are like, well, so what are you gonna do with the eight? You know, what's gonna happen with that? Because they deserve the answers to those questions. So as leaders, we're trying to figure that out. So about 1.30, so, so we have, it's at noon. We're gonna have now at three o'clock central time, we're gonna reconvene for a conference call and everyone's gonna kinda, of, you know, the staff's gonna come back to us and they're gonna give us some suggestions and communication staff. At 1.30 Central Time, it posts on Inman. How do you manage a volunteer association when that's what you've got going on? Now everyone thinks in good faith that Zillow isn't gonna talk. But at this point, what's anybody gonna to do to them if they do? Right? So they publish it. They call them and they get the first word out and there they are. That's what we're dealing with, guys. I mean, that, that's big money, that's big players, that's big data, and, it's, and it, it, it requires a very sophisticated staff, 
a very competent staff, volunteer leaders who we don't get in the way of ourselves, right, to really manage that. And so we get the question of, what are you guys doing, <laughs> you know? And, but those are, those are some real things. And, I, you know, I tell them, it's like, how, how do you handle that when all of a sudden you got one of the largest Internet companies in the world who's violating their own agreement with the court? And so now we're in court now in the afternoon and we're filing, you know, another injunction on them saying they can't talk, but it's too late. I remember our attorney once said, she said, if you're in court, you've already lost. You know, you've already lost the situation. So people say we don't have untrained leaders. And I think, again, this starts to get to the conversation, and we've all had it happen. I mean, I know, you know, in, for our NAR directors in the room, or sometimes you've seen the articles, you know, you get in the conversation, and maybe it is on legislative. And then someone raises their hand, and they ask that question, and you all go, oh, oh, I can't believe they asked that. <clears throat> you know, and it's like, how can they not know that? And so then you switch topics. And you go to the MLS topics, and somebody raises their hand and goes, but what about this? And you're just like, oh, please. And you're hoping they're not from your state, and they're hoping you're not from your board because you're just embarrassed, and you're thinking they don't have a clue what's going on. And you hear, like, the little groan in the room, and you're just like, oh. And we say, you can't be the expert at everything. And it also then challenges us to relook at how we train our leaders, and how are we getting information to the people who are serving in the positions? And are we investing in their success? Or are we just expecting them to have that knowledge when they come in? Because there are very few boards who go through a process with their new incoming leaders who do interviews. Say, okay. I mean, you've got one of the best AEs here in the country who knows not only about association management, but also about managing one of the largest MLSs. So when those leaders come on board, do you know what RETS means? Do you know what IDX means? Do you know the difference between IDX and VAL? You know, we don't generally ask those questions to our members. We just know they're involved. We know they're active. So we think we're going to put them on the board. Then do we invest in their training? One of the things that happened this past year with RPR is they completely changed the way that they train. The year before, um, and this is a 2016 number, but in 2015 they had about 7,000 people who took their webinar training classes. And they did a lot of studying with some different educational systems and universities across the country to try to see how people are learning. And they adjusted their training and they adjusted their marketing. In the first two months in 2016 they had 7,000 people in their webinars. And this you'll see, this was a hosted webinar that had 656 people attend. That's more than most of our education classes, guys. You know, and for all of our agents who still say it's about butts and seats, let's get them to the building, we've got different members learning at different paces and different ways now, you know, so there's different ways that we can kind of empower our agents with that information. But a lot of this conversation of untrained leadership really does kind of circle around the MLS area. And in the MLS area, we've got some things going on. Black Knight, we have literally in our MLS vendors, we have four vendors who kind of control the landscape. Black Knight, CoreLogic, Flex, and Rapitoni encompass the 1.2. The, the challenge with them, all of them have had changes in their top leadership. All of them have declining satisfaction ratings. For the first time, all of them do. They all are supporting multiple platforms or technology. I have an office in Tulsa, Oklahoma for two years. Now you talk about thinking, being pissed off at your board. For two years, we input into one system and we pulled from another. Because they couldn't get the contract right and we were arguing over technology and it was just like, what are we doing? The agents were going crazy. You know, they all have little research and development money. And the, what they say, I love this, this is my favorite. They say that the reason they can't provide better technology is because they've been beaten down so bad by the realtors who are good negotiators. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Come on. Really? Really, that's the business model that you're going to use? The complaint is we beat you down? You know, and so, but here is one of our largest systems you know, that we're trying to manage. Right now, it's for the first time ever, we've gone below 700 MLSs in the country. We're trying to figure this out in this piece of our data and how we manage it. And I'm going to sum all that up, and I said this last week. I said, this isn't your daddy's association anymore. And if you, and, now, and my daddy was in real estate. <laughs> and he'll come in and he'll say something. I'm like, you haven't done that for 20 years. Stop it. You know, 
It's not. You know, we have a very sophisticated things that we're trying to manage here. Very sophisticated regulations, sophisticated technology. It's a different ballgame, and sometimes it doesn't all fit into, you know, the perfect 20 committees or the perfect 10 committees like it used to because there's new things happening in communications and social media that we didn't have. We didn't have some of the portals 10 years ago. And now that's a huge component of our business and how we interact with those portals. And this is the National Association of Realtors kind of org charts you can see at one point in time. Originally in 2010, we had 454 employees. Now we are at about 375 employees. You know, all trying to manage and, and, and oversee this industry. And part of one of the things that we've got to do is not be duplicating the same services at national that happen at state, that happen at the local, that happen at your board, that happen at CRS, that happen at CCIM, where we're all trying to provide the same services and paying for the same dollar. Then our members are just like, ah, heads are spinning going, wait a minute, you know, who plays in this ballpark? And then, you know, when we get ready to hire a new CEO to oversee all this and someone sees what their salary is, the new one's not that same salary, our members get really pissed off and say, are you kidding me? But guys, we need experts. We need experts like Paul. We need people who are managers of this. We need people who get it to oversee this association because otherwise we got a problem. And one of the things that we have today, and I love this chart, is that you just can't please one member. You got to please everybody. And right now we've got the people, we have the plastic surgery addicts on one side, the people who are Twitter obsessed that we've got to please. We got to please the Green Party. Somewhere in there, there's what you might call normal, maybe, I don't know that there is a true normal in any place anywhere anymore, right? You've got the tea part of the old folks and the no impact man. But all of these are our members. And they all play a component of some piece along the way. And some have been members for 20 years. And this is who we're trying to make sure, like this association. And, you know, it says, I love it. It says, because here we're in Austin and we're weird right? <laughs> and there's more people now who are weird than are in the normal box. And that's, I think that's a good thing. I think that's a fun thing. You know, I told this morning, um, we just did an interview and someone said, you know, why should Austin Realtors be involved? And one of the things I said, because weird things do happen here and technology does happen here. And the rest of the country looks to see what happens in Austin. And we see those things that happen on the fringe and those things that people are willing to jump out and own it and have new ideas. And so to have this group of realtors be involved and in seeing those trends as they come you know, down the pike and is very, very critical for the rest of the country. I'll tell you, I'm from Columbia, Missouri. So we have the University of Missouri in our town. And we, we, like to, we would love to be the Little Austin. We would be honored to be called that. <laughs> We've got the coolest restaurants. You know, one of my friends was up from Dallas over the weekend, and she said, she goes, I feel like this is Little Austin. You know, but that's kind of, you know, we, we do look to this community, and we look to your leadership because you have the tech companies coming in, and you've got, you know, the retention of the new talent who comes in of trying to figure out where we head for the future. I think and what one of it means is that we have to be completely laser focused, though, then on where we are headed as an association and being fragmented then only hurts us in the different areas. So for 2018, the strategic priorities and, and again, none of these are earth shattering. I don't think anybody's going to look at this list and go, wow, that's brand new. I've never heard of it. But what has happened is the environment in which we're trying to solve for these solutions has changed. It's changed around us and what it means now to be a professional has changed. We've, got, we've had four PAGs and four work groups since 2007 at the national level to try to help with the professionalism issue. But we can't get a clear definition of what, is, what really is gonna move the needle. And that's one of our goals is just one thing can we identify one thing that's really going to move the needle that we all agree, you know, is that issue? One person told me, and I, it's not a bad idea. I mean, it, if you think about it, it's kind of silly. They said, you know what we should do? We said, we should just make sure that every realtor tells their client that there is a code of ethics. It's not a requirement. And, that, and, and, and say there is a code and you, there is a filing process. 
It's like, well, wouldn't that, we've spent $35 million a year trying to educate the public. Maybe ourselves should educate the 5 million people who buy and sell homes and property each year on the code. Maybe that would do it. Interesting, right? But we've got to, what's, what's that one thing? And it just maybe that one little thing. And then we've got to increase our influence in this uncertain regulatory and political environment. I think we all can agree we're in an, an uncertain environment. No, we don't know where we're headed here. And so to be that protector of the consumer, to be that protector of property rights, to be that protector of our industry, we're going to have to be more proactive. And you guys, again, you have modeled that in Texas. You've been awesome with that in Texas. I know you've done things here in Austin to do that, but we're going to have to do more. We're going to have to be that person who steps out on the real estate issues. Let me go back. We got to take the management of the real estate data to the next level. We cannot, we've, we cannot be behind the big data managers, the Google, the Facebook, the Microsofts, the Zillows of the world who are trying to manage our data for us. We are going to have to figure out a way to be better at managing our data amongst ourselves. And that's probably going to be more money. It's going to be more in consolidation so that we have more money and resources. We're going to have to suck it up and figure that out. Otherwise, we're just sitting here watching these changes happen and we're just, we all know it and we're just watching and watching and watching and not doing anything. And we've got to look at ourselves and again, we got to own it and say it's ours. And if it's not ours, then fine, it's someone else's and we'll just say bye bye. Missouri is a non disclosure state like Texas is. So we have some of those same, you know, kind of conversations with states who are, states who disclose. You know, they have a different conversation on it, but we know that value of what it means to really have those, the data component to it. And then the last one is really ensure that a realtor is essential to the consumer. And we had lots of conversations about this at NAR because for a long time we've talked about the realtor is, um, the, the realtor is the center of the transaction. We're not the center. <laughs> That's not the case. Haven't been the center for a long time. But I do think if we honestly believe that we are essential to the transaction, we've got to fight for it. And we've got to fight for ourselves. And do we honestly believe that our public is better served if there's a realtor involved in that transaction? Yes. yes. Say it louder. Yes. Yes, I mean, we have got to believe it. And so for those different points along the way where we see people who are trying to intermediate and we know they're trying to automate some of the decisions that we make, which can't be automated, no one's ever going, I would love it, when the even technology geeks, they said, no one's ever going to be able to sit across the table from that seller and interpret the glance. That little glance that you see where they go, or they look over to their spouse or their partner or someone else. They said, show me the AI who's going to figure out that. That's what we figure out when we see it, that moment. And there's lots of moments in the transaction where that exists. And that's where we've got to own it. We have to take, we have to embrace that and know that this is our decision. It's no one else's. No one else is doing this at this moment in time. And I think then it starts to come back to why we do this. You know, the what we do is that we protect our private property rights. You know, then there's the how. The how is the local association. The how is the state association. And the how is the national. And I hope the fact that you're here, you know that we are more powerful when we're doing that together. And that when all three of us are moving in the same direction and we're not fighting against each other, we're not being pissed off at each other, and I'll tell you, that's one of the reasons I'm here. We had a, we've had a very frank conversation with the NR leadership team. Um, our policy has always been that we visit states. States are great. But states aren't where it's happening. States are usually handling the political and the legislative pieces of it. The real boots on the ground are at the local. 12,500 members, the size of your membership, is larger than the state of Iowa. So better be in Austin having a conversation with one of our largest boards in the country and really having our members understand, you know, where this all fits in and, and showing the respect, I think, to the associations who are trying to manage the MLS data and trying to manage, you know, our businesses as we are and how that all fits in the organization. Because those are the more of the conversations that we have here at the local level. But then I think it trickles down to the why. I mean, why are you here? 
you've now taken time out of your business. You know, I mean, people who know that we volunteer, if they really understood the time that we put into this, they'd think we're crazy. <laughs> right? they, they would think we are absolutely insane. You know, but I think we all have the different whys that we're here in those different stories. Um, we started the conversation with disruption and what it really means, you know, to kind of be disrupted in this industry. When I was 18, I was in a social studies class, and I remember that day, it was December 16th, and I got a phone call, and you got to go down to the office. And so I go down into the office, and my dad's there, and he said, we got to go. I was like, okay. You know, he's like, no, 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 we got to go right now. And my boyfriend at the time, his house was burning down. And he was at a different high school, and so he had gotten a hold of my dad, and we, we got out there. And by the time we got out there, it was about a 7,000-square-foot house. It, it, it almost was to the ground. It had just exploded. His dad ended up was inside when it happened. Um, his mom and his sister were actually on a shopping trip that day. They had skipped school that day, and she had taken her daughter to Kansas City to go shopping. And we got out there, and... You know, you look back on your history and you things that, you know, just kind of how things go through your life. He, um, it, it, to watch someone lose their home and, and someone that you love was just, I mean, it was the worst thing ever. You know, no pictures at the time. You know, I remember at the end of the day, they didn't have toothpaste. You know, you don't have clothes when you wake up the next morning. And to see them and kind of what happened over the next course of, you know, really the next year. They actually were originally from Midland, Texas. And then, um, and, it, and it was a year later. And they, they finished out the school year in some temporary housing that they rented. But a year later, they just, they just all left. And they just almost left. It was almost like they left overnight. But it was like they just had to leave and be gone. And they moved back here to Austin, <laughs> actually. Um, and he's now lives back in Missouri for some different reasons, but, but none of them have ever come back to the town. And I remember one of the things that happened, it was like a few months later and you think of things that you miss that might be out of the house. There was some dry cleaning that had been out of the house that day. And the dry cleaners were trying to track them down. And this was before cell phones and stuff. So we're trying to track them down. And th this wasn't what the pillow said, but it was a bl blue pillow with these white checks on it. And he had this pillow. And when he got this pillow back, he just sobbed. And I mean, he was just crying and crying and crying because it was like that one thing that he had. He didn't have anything else. And now he had kind of this pillow back and some clothes. And that's, that's the true disruption. That's disruption in this industry. When we see people who should have homes who don't have homes. When we know that there are people who are being forced out of their property because the taxes are too high. You know, when all of a sudden they have to leave the homes because somebody had gave them a bad lending product that we knew they should have. That is disruption. And that, I think, is what we're fighting for. That's my why. When I think back and you think about why do you do this and why do you volunteer the time? And I know that every single one of you has a story like this. You have some reason that you put somebody in a home for the first time. You helped somebody with their investment property that's now paying, you know, for someone's college. I mean, that's the real difference that I think just no one else can touch. A computer can't touch it. You know, a company can't touch it. It's what every single one of our members have when they volunteer and when they spend their time. And that's what makes me so proud of knowing that we are going to be here 10 years from now. And we are going to be here 15 years from now because we care just like no other. So I will tell you, I'm honored to be with you all here today. I want to thank you so much for inviting me. I know we're going to take some questions afterwards, but thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> hey, how do you want to yeah. hang? Yeah, hi. <laughs> yeah, hi. I knew you looked familiar. <laughs> I'm Mark Minchu with Remax yeah. Austin. Very few solutions are the one thing. However, in the professionalism yeah. and the relevancy and the relationship between uh, hours of study and performance is accountability. And yeah. without accountability, there is no responsibility. I do not feel like we enforce our code of ethics the way we should. 
I don't feel like we uh, communicate to the other realtors the penalties that are suffered. It's all a secret. If we want to eliminate the names, fine. But until you have accountability, I don't think the the guy sitting in the back reading the newspaper during the education conference just to get hours yeah. is not getting educated. But if they know there's accountability, they would. So I think if there's one thing that would make a difference there is accountability and responsibility of the members to adhere to the code of ethics. No, I think that's a great point. You know, I told somebody the other day, I said, we have one point three million members who have agreed to subscribe to the code. They haven't agreed to adhere to the code. <laughs> you know, they, you know, there was a little bit of a difference of that piece of it. Um, on to your point on that, there's in what came up and, and we've done, I think we've done now five studies of different things of what accountability looks like, what competency looks like is another word that's you know, kind of consistently used the whole broker component to this of is the broker actually, you know, who's the ones on the line. And the other piece that's come of it to your point on the reading the magazines in the background, you know, like some states have uh, is the accountability for the instructor. You know, to to say, okay, wait, that's not okay. And some states have do you guys have um, evaluations on your instructors? Yeah, and some states can't even get evaluations on their instructors. It's like, okay, well, great. Well, let's go sign up for 10 more hours of bad CE because that's going to solve it, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah, good point. What else? Can I answer for you? or? This really is kind of everybody's opportunity <laughs> yeah. to engage and ask questions. If you've ever you know, been curious about anything on the national level, sure. uh, we have brought her down here for you to have this opportunity <laughs> to, to make a comment or ask a question. And so we'll just ask that you go to that microphone um, to be able to, everybody can hear. Yeah. Don't be shy. <laughs> I'm just a realtor. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. what are y'all doing on the data management side of things in terms of better managing the data? Yeah. Um, there's a little bit of a wall between our MLS side of the organization and the association side of the organization. So it's a little bit different in different places. Like you guys are like my association to where you're managing your own MLS. But in many places, and the MLS is being managed by not the association, different leadership. For example, like we just got back with our leadership summit last week. Well, those are, it's great because it was all the incoming board presidents. wasn't the incoming MLS presidents who then manage and oversee the leadership of that single side. And I think we have failed as an association because we've kind of left them do their own thing. They're very, you know, we have, of course, CMLS has taken the leadership in that area of having conferences, but it, then it seems like it's detached. It doesn't seem like it's NAR. So then ultimately NAR has the MLS policies. And so then it becomes kind of this war of the two things. So in the course of the past year, we've now, we're now sharing some leadership between CMLS and NAR. I think the next um, evolution that we are going to see potentially with core standards, again, might piss some people off, is, to, is knowing we all know where MLSs are, we know where it's headed, right? And so then are we really preparing ourselves for it? Are we preparing our associations to be self-sustaining without MLS income? You know, knowing that that's gonna be the direction. Shannon uh, Williams King is here. She was, we all, she vice chaired strategic planning with me um, and chaired it in 2013. In 2012, we did a survey or a program called Rethink. It's fascinating, fascinating because what we did is we based it off of the book called The Art of the Long View, which is scenario planning. And all of, it's like 80% of the top Fortune 500 companies use scenario planning to determine their strategic futures. So we created these scenarios with data from realtors all across the country of where we thought things would be going in the next five years. So these were now videos in 2012. When you go back and look at these three, <laughs> there's, well, there's actually five videos almost everything in the videos has come true. It's crazy. Like there's a video called Beauty and the Beast. Um, I wish I had it because I had to show it. Um, so it's, it's back in 2012. It talks about the fact that companies who seem to be enemies will merge. Zillow and Trulia. Um, you know, even Amazon and Whole Foods, right? It also talks about we're going to have a crazy political environment in the 2016 election. Like it shows people tearing up ballots and whoever. And at that point, we don't know who's going to run, right? 
And it talks about the fact of this MLS area. At the time when we showed the videos, 60% of our members didn't think that was a plausible future. But yet, the members who created the scenarios knew it was. So it's almost like we're staring ourselves in the face going, I don't want it to happen, so I'm gonna say I don't want it to happen, but it is gonna happen. So that's one thing potentially with core standards is try to make sure our boards are better prepared for when the mergers happen and when the consolidation happens that we get to be at a better place. You know, and it doesn't, you know, in some, and it doesn't mean that there's a goal of going down to five MLSs. It just means that there's a goal of being better with the management of where we are in the places where we have it so that there's more you know, talent in the pool. Yeah. What's the future of <laughs> Good question. <laughs> That's another one. If I had the answer, I would tell you. Um, I think the concept is still very valid. <coughs> um, you know, when I started, I actually, in 98, I had a meeting with Fidelity. And it, they, we, at the time, we mapped out how many times you input your data. And now, of course, it's just more. You know, it's estimated that there's 80 different times that we input that data throughout the transaction. They, um, they're on track, the betas are on track. There's five different um, associations who have done some beta. I think it's now it's gonna be a funding issue. We have, and I think that's another place where our members are looking to NAR and saying, are you doing the best you can with the money? You know, is RPR being spent the best you can with the money? Is upstream being spent the best you can with their money? I am very positive about our new CEO's outlook on how that can be managed. If you realize the area of the association where he came from, he came from marketing and strategic initiatives to where he actually grew some of the non-dues revenue that we have in the association to pay for the entire governance side by partnerships and even by advertising revenue with different people. You know, there's, there's, we don't have advertising, for example, in RPR right now. Would we sacrifice some advertising to cover some of the costs? I think we all probably would. So I'm very hopeful with his mind. He also has, um, and he's calling it um, not in-house, of saying, okay, what are our competencies and what should we do in-house and what should we do out of house? Um, technology hasn't always been our best competency. <laughs> and there's other people who have developed technologies faster and more rapidly than we have who probably would be partners with us. And so I think we're, we're gonna have a, certainly a very big overlook at all of those data initiatives um, sooner than later. Yeah, yeah. Is it, I'll talk loud, is it possible to put images in your newsletters? <laughs> I love you, you're so awesome. Is it possible to put images in your newsletter? I would put them all in tonight. Um, our communications suck. They totally suck and that is one of the reasons. I mean, it's just like this text and it's a mess and you're like, are you kidding me? And um, Shannon is just your member communications. They did, a they did do a study where they said our members, some of our members don't want images, but then the platform's old. Yeah, my, one of my top agency always says the internet's meant to be um, viewed, not read. You know, and I think that's such a good point. No, it, they suck. That whole department has to be overdone. I mean, it's, it's, it sucks. I don't know how to say it any better than that. I got, I, I got some, <laughs> I got some talking points from that department about six months ago <laughs> about, um, and they were like, here, well, here's your talking points and here's what you can go say. And one of the talking points was that 1.2 million realtors get their magazine six times a year. I'm like, Okay, that's in our vomit. I'm like, you want me to go out on the road and tell our members that the postal service works? Yay! <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm not gonna say that. That's not the type of stuff that our members wanna hear. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's top priority. <laughs> yeah. Concerning professionalism, I've always been curious why the Association of Realtors, uh, our associations of realtors, don't have something like attorneys have, a bar, to have an exam to where you can't just go pay money to become a realtor and just, you know, do whatever. That's why we let in so many folks that really shouldn't be in this business. But if we had a, 
an exam. You can go get your real estate license, but to call yourself a realtor, I've always felt that there should be some sort of test to qualify for being a realtor. And we don't, and therefore you just pay your money, you join the board, and you get all these people um, in, in this business that really shouldn't be in the business and they don't stay in the business, but they kind of drag the business down, mm -hmm. you know, over time. Anyway, that was just my comment. I think we should have some sort of a, a bar uh, for realtors. It's not money. It's not just more education, but some sort of a, an exam, a test to see who's good and who's not good. Right. <laughs> um. <laughs> You know, it's and it is. It's a. It's just a complicated. Um, it's complicated. It, it's a complicated thing because then, you know, there's always. I can I can argue it on both sides. It just depends. You tell me which one you want. You know, then it's if we create a level, what happens to those who don't? Would we rather have them subscribing to the code, or would we rather have half a million people out there still selling real estate who don't? You know, and then what does the What's the cost alternative mean? You know, the good, the good thing so far in the industry with license law is even to this date, um, there's a couple of states, the Thompson states, so Florida, Georgia, Washington, and California, who they don't have to be a realtor in order to be a member of the MLS. So they still have access to that piece of it. I mean, so that's a different environment in those states. They were, we still see the number of homes sold by realtors in the 90s. I mean, the, the, of all properties, all properties sold by realtors, 90% of them are, 90% are, of those properties are sold by realtors. So the good thing is when you adjust the license law, you really are affecting the majority of realtors. So there is, you know, do you, do you create another test or is the license law the test for the majority? It still kind of flows on that. But I think California, I've, I've always been fascinated with that them because when the decline happened and we saw Georgia took huge hits where in Georgia, this is crazy, in Georgia, the Georgia Association of Realtors provided their contracts and forms to anyone. Didn't have to be a realtor. So when the downturn happened, they had huge split offs of people who were non-realtors and realtors but still had all the access to the MLS and all the contracts. Versus to like a state of Washington, you still had, in order to get the forms, you still had to be a realtor. So there was still that cost benefit there. But in California, they didn't see some of the declines where you would have thought you would have seen fragmentation between realtors and non-realtors. You didn't see it because their benefits package is so amazing. Those members want to be, it's, they want to be part of that realtor association. So all those things like come up during these conversations. That's why it's not easy. You know, it's. Um, it's a challenge, and then I think there is the fear of we've seen people who are now not only trying to get into the industry, but now they're trying to get into the association business in some instances, and then what does it look, then does a realtor still have the same same place? Well, uh, we're going to try to figure it out, we're, and you know what, and we'll keep trying, and we will keep trying, and we'll keep trying, and we might fail, and we'll keep trying, and we'll just keep, because it's worth trying for. Uh, still tax reform. I think we're going to see tax reform. Um, we met with uh, Gary Cohn. Um, lots of he's been in the news a lot lately about the uh, state and local income tax deductions, um, mortgage interest deduction. He's not really interested in touching, so that's good. Same thing with 1031s, but I think um, he's not. We'll still see that in obviously Senate and the House. Um, I think the other piece that we'll see is we've got to get this flood insurance piece resolved. There's call for action out right now, so make sure you've responded to the call for action. Um, <laughs> I hope in the next few days you guys don't prove how much we need flood insurance in the state of Texas. <laughs> we'll cross our fingers on that. <laughs> um, and then I think the other piece of it is, um, you know, we're still seeing, we're, it, we're, it's easy enough, but the land use, a lot of some of the land use issues that are happening, um, we'll see more and more of that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think, so your question I think is perfect because it's the question then that you're asking of the association. And that becomes a very hard question for the association to answer is do you want the association to answer the business model questions? And I think there, as the business model is fluctuating so much and it's so uncertain, the person that our members look to is the association to say, answer that business model question. For us to get into the business model, um, to, to advocate for one over another, is a very, very, I think, dangerous place for us to be and one we've traditionally tried to stay away from, which then leads us to the conversation of what we do believe and advocate for is that a realtor is essential to the transaction and, and that we need to continue to move forward with that comment. And it may mean, it may, it may be being proactive on legislation and regulation to ensure that. You know, in the state of Missouri, in about 2007, we passed minimum standards laws, which said different things that had to happen. And we actually had the DOJ come in. They went, were sat in the governor's office for three weeks and said, no, 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 no. And we said, yes, 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 and ended up passing it. And I could see more of that happening in this environment of us saying no. You know, you, you believe attorneys are still important. You believe a doctor is still important. And by God, we know that a transaction and a consumer is better protected when a realtor is involved and not a piece of machine. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Jim Smith of the Property Management Company. Yeah. Been a broker for over 30 years and been very active in local, state, and national uh, volunteer and leadership. Something I have found to be an issue and still is an issue, in my humble opinion, uh, and I, I suspect that many of us here could spend all day chatting with you about different concerns, but I'm going to bring up the communication issue again. Yeah. We seem to have such a disconnect. Just like in order for me to find out what's going on in our country, I read international papers mm -hmm. because our country seems to be more stuck on fluff and they're not really talking about the substance. Most of the communication that I see coming out of NAR to me seems to be fluff pieces. When you open up the Realtor magazine, it's a lot of fluff. It's about how I did a successful open house or a sale or something. I don't see hardcore information coming out. I don't want to find out that we're having issues that we're addressing through Inman or through other sources. I'd like for us to take ownership of it and disseminate that information to the membership because a lot of times we may have somebody that within our membership that has a good response <coughs> and a good answer to it. Many of us in here are members of the President's Circle or we're in Hall of Fames and that kind of thing. We get some very powerful communication that is specific to what NAR is working on. Why doesn't the rest of the membership get that kind of information? Oh, I would I, suspect that most of us who are sucks. brokers have agents. They, <laughs> most of the agents in our area, and I suspect throughout the country, are members for one reason, the MLS. Mm -hmm. All right, Code of Ethics is secondary. But how can we get the communication out there, not just to those of us who have been around for a while, but to the millennials and everybody in between, to let them know that NAR is there for a reason. And these are the hardcore things. We're a family. We're addressing issues. We have dirty laundry. Let's deal with it. Okay. Let's throw it out there and say these are real issues that we're working on. Instead of putting out these fluff pieces that, quite frankly, I'm tired of reading and choose not to anymore because it's a waste of my time. So back to the communication. How do we get that information out there? It, it, again, the whole department has to be revamped, and it's priority one. I mean, I, I will tell you that is priority one. It was priority one when we um, interviewed for a new CEO from two places, one of the people we were interviewing and one the, see, I don't know, yeah, Shannon's going to chair member communication in a second. There's, um, to your point on the, so I'll give you a perfect example. I went ballistic, ballistic, because as a leadership team member, I get, I'll get something that gets embargoed like 30 minutes before it's going to hit at 9 a.m., Okay, that may be a really relevant piece of information. So I get it, I see it at 9.30, and now all of a sudden, or 8.30, let's say 8.30, and all of a sudden 9 o'clock hits, and the first person that comes to me is from Inman. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. And I mean, I will tell you, I am screaming and shouting on the email, and I'm like, are you kidding me? Why, you, I know it was our information, why did I get it from Inman at 9 o'clock? And it's a philosophy that is change, that will change. I will tell you, will change 100%. And the philosophy was that we put out the news, we don't necessarily report the news. And we said, no, 
no, no, no, no, no. That is not going to happen anymore. Because, and so, and then, and then there was a philosophy of, and this is, this is, this is, and some of you may, this is changes in journalism, in the journalism world. The philosophy was that if we put it out to MN Yahoo, MSNBC, all those things, that they will report it more if they know that we haven't reported it already. So we gave it to them to report. And I'm like, okay, that makes sense, except with our members. Our members should hear it from us, not from someplace else. And I will, I mean, please, I mean, I don't, I will tell you that we have, the leadership team is 100% behind you on that because it's like, no, wait, if it's, if it's industry related, okay, great. Let MSNBC report it. But if it has to do with us, our members should hear it from us, you know, and with different channels. So Shannon, yeah. I just, this, this is great to hear from you guys. I'm going to turn this way. <laughs> so Sh Shannon's chair of the member communications committee next year. And yeah. this is what we've been working on this year. We literally have a work group discussing these conversations. And one of the things we proposed, and I would love your feedback. Um, right now we have the text message for the call to actions, right? Things like when big things come down that affect us, one of the things that we sent out a survey and not many people responded, so I'm going to take an impromptu survey. But in important situations where we get news directly from Elizabeth that says this is what's going on and it's going to hit the news, would you guys like a, a text message for that? Like the breaking news, this is going to hit and this is our opinion on it. Would y'all like that? Yeah. Yeah. So, but. But here's the thing is that's an opt-in. You have to opt-in that you want to receive that information. But hearing that from you guys, we can take that mm -hmm. back to, you know, powers that be that say, Boston Board of Realtors wants text messages. That's good. We need that, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and, I, and I will say, um, it should be. It should be. Yeah, and, that, and that's where you, you would take a membership application and have it on an application for all the new members to be able to, you know, there's some of the different laws on that. It, how can I say that? I'm, I'm, well, yeah, we, you know, we're, it's, it's a new vision. It's a new day. We have a new CEO. You know, we have a new vision. And our last CEO led a, was a financial wizard and master. Came from the CPA department. Um, and managed us through a industry crisis time where most businesses failed and we should have failed. Um, but he not only improved our financial, our real estate position, our investment position to a place where, you know, we are a strong association. Everybody has their strengths. Communication was not one of them. And, you know, that department has been run like a department from 1990, and it's now time to run it from a department and they and they are ex the department is excited knowing that now things can go in new directions I mean again it's number one when we came into the final interviews um, we had three different people with all sorts of three different backgrounds and you know and every single one of them you know we're having the conversation with the search committee priority number one is communication so there's no I mean it, it sucks <laughs> Hi. Um, technology is changing rapidly and worldwide, and we have we NAR has more than 800 board of directors. Mm -hmm. They only meet twice a year mm -hmm. to make decisions. I mean, we our association have monthly meeting, board board meeting. We, we still have a handful of decisions to be made. Yeah. Just meeting twice a year. I'm not sure how that would be really rapidly changing industry to meet our needs for 1.3 million members. So do you have any suggestions or any, any mm -hmm. of a future modification or anything updates? Yeah, the, um, the good and the bad is the leadership team is, uh, um, does have the authority to make decisions in between those meetings for rapidly pacing issues. So the good of that is, is that seven people can make a decision when they need to, and, and many times we do. Um, the bad is it's seven people, it's not 15. You know, it's a small group. There's some organizational studies which have shown that the best decisions are made between like seven and 17 people. You know, that kind of falls in that range. And so um, we've entertained things like, you know, and then to take away positions in our organization doesn't feel good, but we've entertained ideas of having 
um, multi-level governance game changer idea where we just get everybody and say let's let's go for it and let's throw the ideas and let's start voting on them and what do we like and what do we not like and do we still want a board of directors but maybe they have less less um, decision making skills that we then empower to maybe the executive committee you know which is would be a smaller body to kind of you know move in between um, you know do we reallocate the costs if you think of all the costs that every board and every state spends to send those members to the meeting you know at that point who are they representing um, I I look forward to seeing some of those ideas brainstormed in the next year. I just have to make sure my leadership team agrees with me. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to stand up here. Yes. And, and so thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. Our National Association of Realtors, the Texas Association of Realtors, and the Austin Board of Realtors is compiled a, a wonderful group of individuals. And we've heard a lot of things that we're not doing right. But we do an awful lot of things yes. right today. And National does a lot of things right. And I want to take and, and give everybody an opportunity to understand that Mr. Stanton retired after years of great, great service. And he did a lot of things right. And so we need to be proud of our National Association. And we need to be here as partners with a voice to make it better. Not to leave here despairing what you've heard and taking it out bits and pieces and making it worse. Use what you've learned today and make it better. And, and understand that what you are a part of is the strongest voice in the nation for political advocacy. They give us a code of ethics which is stronger than any other. And that what you do in the lives of the community every day matters more than anything else or any other position that's out there. Because our job stems the economy and it helps improve the betterment of lives throughout the nation every single day. So thank you for being here. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what, what I hope you leave with is I hope that you can recognize and, and maybe I said it or maybe I didn't is that we're the leadership team. We're just realtors too. And if you think it, we probably think it too. You know, <laughs> I mean, if, it's, if you know it's kind of a thread, it's not something that, you know, we're ignoring. It's something we're, that we're all trying to solve. Again, I don't think anybody takes the time and volunteers this much time to make this association worse. You know, we certainly try to make it better. And you all, I know you all are counting on us as a leadership team to to continue to make it better. And what Susan said is right. I mean, you know, we're in an amazing position and we had so many people who wanted to be the CEO of this association because of the power of all of our members and what we can do when we're all united around those amazing causes and when we're wanting to find, you know, and continue to, to change the industry because it's very, very empowering to know that we can change it and we can change it for the better and we it's we have that power and when you embrace that and when you own it you know it's a, it's a it's 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 one of the best professions in the world let's take a moment and thank elizabeth Thanks. Thanks. i want to just just close by saying a couple of things to inform you about what's what's happening here um one you will see uh, available to you on your website, this, is, this session has been videoed. And so what we'd ask for every one of you to do, <laughs> we'd ask for every one of you to do is, and be ambassadors of this message to others in this association uh, who don't really know what NAR is doing and the struggles that they are working with every day to try to be a better association uh, for you, for the members. Uh, this association needs your help in communicating the message that leadership is not easy, that it is, uh, it is a challenge to address 1.3 million members, uh, where they all are uh, and, and, and how they all are. The thing I would close with that I really greatly appreciate is 
the fact that this board has now risen to a level to, and, and that NAR's desires for strategic planning have come to a point to where they converge where we have the president saying, I need to be at the local association. And you have the local association saying, I need to hear from the national leadership. And those two desires have now converged for us to be able to take the opportunity to have Shannon, who's on the planning team and a, and a primary member of Austin, by the way, say, gosh, this is great information. We are full of great, dedicated, hardworking volunteers who know how to make improvements to this industry. And they want to do that all the time. So that's what we do. Um, um, and that's who we are as an association. But most importantly, I want you to leave here recognizing that NAR is in extremely capable hands under the leadership of Elizabeth Mendenhall. Her passion, her sincerity, her honesty, and the fact that she is a sixth generation realtor is, is evidence of her commitment to this industry. And it is a great honor to have you in this association and we wanna pledge our support to you. Thank you. Thank you all very much.